Welcome back to our Fox News Town Hall here in the Myers Center at the University of Dubuque with New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. We're going to get back to questions in a moment, but first, here's a closer look at the senator's life and career. Kirsten Gillibrand has spent the past 12 years representing the state of New York in Congress. First in the House, where she voted with conservative Democrats, then replacing Hillary Clinton in the Senate after President Obama named Clinton to be his Secretary of State. When she took the oath of office from Vice President Biden, the working mother of two became the youngest member of the Senate at age 42. It was then her record grew more liberal. When I became senator of the entire state, I recognized that some of my views really did need to change. Gillibrand was born in Albany, New York in 1966, growing up in a household active in state politics. She graduated from Dartmouth, where she majored in Asian studies, learning to speak Mandarin. Ni hao ma, hao bu hao. And interviewed the Dalai Lama for her thesis. Gillibrand has been a champion of women's issues in the Senate, addressing sexual assaults in the military. It's still hurting our military readiness. It's still causing thousands of our service members to suffer. Equal pay. I would make sure that women can thrive in the workplace. And anti-abortion laws. She's taken heat inside her party after calling for Senator Al Franken to step down because of allegations of sexual harassment. We need to draw a line in the sand and say none of it is okay. And saying Bill Clinton should have resigned during the Monica Lewinsky affair. The strongest and best mentor... Has Gillibrand been... still calls Hillary Clinton a role model. Now she looks to follow in her mentor's footsteps one more time to the top of the Democratic ticket. Let's get right back to questions in our town hall. This one from Sandy Hockenberry. Sandy. Hi, Senator. <clears throat> How do you plan, if you're the candidate, to reach those voters that voted for Obama twice and then turned around in 2016 and voted for Trump? So my plan uh, for winning over all voters is to show up, uh, listen, hear what's on people's minds, and then fight for them. Uh, that's what I've done in my whole career uh, as a public servant. When I first ran for Congress in 2006, my House district was a two-to-one Republican district. I won the district the first time by six points and the second time by 24 points. Since then, I've had three Senate races in 2010, 12, and 18. In those three races, I have the highest vote total in the history of the state at 72 percent. That's higher than President Obama, higher than Hillary Clinton, higher than any person who's run for Senate or governor ever. And in the last election, I just won back 18 of the counties that went for President Trump. So I believe that I can bring people together because that's what I've done. I campaign in red places and blue places and purple places. And I make sure I listen to my constituents everywhere. And then I build bipartisan support to pass legislation. So even in the last Congress, I passed 19 bills that President Trump signed into law. I don't even know that he knows he signed it into law, but he did. And, uh, and I've passed big bills. I was the leader on repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, and led the movement to make sure we passed gay rights uh, on the federal level for our men and women who are serving in our armed services. Uh, and I uh, passed legislation to pro protect our 9-11 first responders with health care. So I'm just going to apply the lessons of my last 12 years of just campaigning everywhere. Uh, the good news for people who want to defeat Trump is that in uh, the last election in 2018, we saw an amazing breakthrough in elections across this country where women ran uh, on, their, on their values, on their passions. Uh, we flipped the House because 120 women ran for Congress and won, and they won in red places and purple places. Uh, governor's races like Gretchen Whitmer, she won Michigan that Trump had won in the presidential. She won it by 10 points on the issue of health care as a right, not a privilege. Kirsten Sinema ran in the red, red state of Arizona and won. Amazing House candidates like Lucy McBath ran in the suburbs of Atlanta on ending gun violence because she lost her son to gun violence. That's what elections are about. It's about people running for the right reasons on what they believe. And I am the candidate that can bring this country together because we need someone who will stand up to the special interests and who will do what's right, um, no matter how hard it is. And that's who I am. And that's how we will heal as a country. And that's how I will win the election. Senator. Last 
Last December, you tweeted something, and I want to put it up on the screen and, and get you to explain it to us. You tweeted this. Our future is female, intersectional, powered by our belief in one another. Uh, two questions there. What do you mean our future is female? Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of us, because I've been trying to study the up to prepare for this, what's your definition of intersectional? Good questions. Really good questions. I'm, I'm glad I got one. People want to know. <laughs> they want to know this all, right, all the time. All right, but what do you mean first our future yes. is female? So what I mean by our future is female is that we want more women's voices heard. I was so inspired by the 2018 election. Those 120 women who ran in the red and purple places across the country broke through. Our first two Muslim American women, our first two Native American women, young women, diverse women. And so we want women to have a seat at the table. What about it's, men? They're already there. Do you not know? <laughs> But I guess what I'm asking is, are we part of the future, too? Yes, you're already there. So it's not meant That's to very be... That's reassuring. It's not meant to be exclusionary. It's meant to be inclusionary. Oh, okay, so good. So we just want to we like add it. a couple more chairs okay. for the rest of us. All right, we're not And that's how we do it. So that's all it is. All right, now, definition of intersectional. intersectional. So what intersectional means to me is when you are discriminated against in more than one way. So, for example, a black woman... She's discriminated on the basis of racism, and she's discriminated on the basis of sexism. Someone from the disability community is also discriminated on the basis of that. And so someone in the LGBT community. So if you're a woman, LGBT, and black, you are discriminated three ways. So intersectionality is the same thing about inclusivity. It's saying, please understand that our strength is in our diversity. And in the decision-making tables, if you have a diverse set of people, they're going to see different problems, and they're also going to see different solutions. And I've seen that every part of my elected life, that every time someone new is at that table, you see the world slightly differently. It's why I said when I put my cabinet together as president, someone from the disability community will be part of my cabinet, because they will not be left behind. Next question for you. Let's hear from Sean Benson, who is a professor right here at the University of Dubuque. Sean. Good evening, Senator. Yeah. My question is, do you believe that economic capitalism has been the greatest force for creating opportunity in the world? Or if not, what would you replace it with? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> do you want me to say more? I'm happy to say more. Okay, so... Well, you say more, but in the context of, of there question? are an awful lot of people yes. in your party who are pushing socialism. And in fact, John Hickenlooper, the very distinguished former governor of Colorado, spoke at the California State Democratic Convention yesterday and said socialism is not the answer. And guess what? He got booed. Okay, so there's a lot of confusion. Um, there's a big difference between capitalism and greed. And that's where this divide has begun. Because we know what healthy capitalism looks like. It looks like the greatest country on earth, the United States, growing economy constantly, generation after generation, because of entrepreneurialism, because of innovation, because of hard work, because of determination. That's capitalism when it's thriving. But over the last few decades, we've seen income inequality grow. Because we care today more about shareholders than we do about workers. A company that wants to pollute our air and water, they care more about profits than they care about the well-being of the people in their community. The drug companies, let's take the opioid crisis. We've seen from documents, those families that were producing opioids, they cared more about profits and wanted the most addictive opioid they could find than the people they were trying to serve. When we want to get to health care as a right, not a privilege, it's the insurance companies that care more about profit than covering their patients. So they'll deny that second day in the hospital or the, or the medicine that you need or the procedure. That, so that's when we have the corruption of capitalism. You get it? So the corruption of capitalism is the definition of greed. And so what we are trying to fight against is the worst instincts of companies that care more about their shareholder value than their 
employees than their workers or the people in their community. That's when they choose to pollute. That's when they choose to addict patients. That's when they choose to sell a weapon over a common sense gun reform. Every single one. So we want common sense reform in all these areas, and we want an economy that thrives. And I have a whole set of ideas, which I'll wait to be asked about, Chris, because it's a longer answer, on how we start rewarding work again and how we start fixing our economy.